Thank you, Ecoversities. Nice to be with you all. Thanks for joining us. I'm I I'm agreeing. I love the the I think it's a train, but I love the train background. Your background bloom. <laughs> this is making me happy as I see someone else wrote in the chat. Um, my name is Lauren Haig, and I use she her pronouns, and I'm the executive director at Weaving Earth. And I am grateful to be here with my dear friends and collaborators and Weaving Earth program directors, Bronte, Velez, and Will Scott. And Taylor was supposed to be with us today, but unfortunately has pneumonia and is quite sick and unable to make it. So I um, spoke with her through text today because talking is not, not quite in the cards for her today. And she sends her greetings and care to you all. And um, if you haven't encountered Taylor before, I just wanted to um, encourage you to check out her book, Nourishing the Nervous System. It's a really beautiful little book published by Loam, which is uh, which is Weaving Earth's publishing branch. Um, and it's really beautiful. So thank you, Taylor. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, I'm gonna just give a little bit of an intro about Weaving Earth, kind of share some orientation for what we're thinking for today um, and begin with an invocation and then pass it to the team for some introductions and, and take it from there. So um, thank you, Salo, for what you already said about Weaving Earth. And just to add a little bit more, um, we, we are dedicated to a pedagogy that we, we, we conceive the word relational education in an attempt to find language for um, pedagogy that centers interrelationships in practice, in living, in learning, in study. And through that, we're seeking to, as Salo said, regenerate the wisdom of intuition alongside tangible skills for living in and responding to the climate emergency. And so our four key practice areas that kind of um, flow and weave together our earth intimacy, co-liberation, embodiment, somatics, and prayerful action. And through our nonprofit, we offer educational programming and consulting in those four practice areas for youth, for teens, for adults, and for organizations. And that's a little bit about Weaving Earth, and you can find more about us at weavingearth.org. And, um, Today, we're going to be in a fluid conversation and kind of co-facilitate each other, Bronte, Will, and myself, and we'll probably prompt each other with some questions and answer and banter and see where the conversation goes. And there's also an option if you have any questions or prompts that you'd like to um, us to respond to, you can put them in the chat and we will do our best to weave them together into, into where this conversation is headed. Um, and that's pretty much the flow. We've got a nice hour together. And I wanna, I wanna start with an invocation and to just invite us to find a way to get just even a little bit more comfortable if you can in your seat. Maybe you need to like shuffle, maybe you wanna turn your head, maybe you wanna move your shoulders, maybe you wanna stay perfectly still, whatever it might be to just See if you can find us a little bit more comfort and invite yourself to fully be here. I don't know if you've been in the conference all day, but I know it's a lot of um, amazing things happening and over Zoom. So if you need to wiggle your body throughout this time, please do. Um, and I'm gonna read this invocation. So if you wanna um, soften your gaze or close your eyes or look out the window or whatever it is that you wanna do um, to, to be with me, please do. May our attention be loving and gentle. May our senses attune ever deeper with the earthscapes we are a part of. May our felt sense of interrelationship with the living planet be affirmed, our earth intimacy evoked. An intimacy born of slowness, time, attention, humility, care, familiarity, and love. Earth intimacy as a prayer to upend whatever investments we might have in notions of human supremacy. As a bomb to separation and a continual courting of relation. As in feeling, believing, knowing that we are a part of, belonged to, belonged by, upheld within, woven of each other. 
cradle and a boundaried connection that supports both our interdependence and our differentiation. A multi-species thriving, a harmonizing of our inner and outer earth. May our loving, may our attention be loving and gentle. Welcome, welcome. And that was, I wrote that as a part of an invocation for our TUNE program, which yes, we are all uh, co-creators and co-facilitators of, and then adapted it for a um, print newsletter that we just put out for the autumn season, which is, which is the season we're in here in um, Northern California, Southern Pomo territory. And I want to pass it to the team to do some intros. And my prompt to us all is share your name and anything else you want to say to identify yourself or bring yourself in. Um, and if you could share a more than human anchor who is a guide for you in your attunement as a way to collect, continue our collective invocation, let's do that too. And... I don't know, Bronte, do you want to go first or do you want Will to go first? I see Will's unmuted already, so. Okay, okay, you smiled at me, so I thought, all right. I'm ready. Go I'm ahead, ready. Will. I'm staying unmuted. I'm going to try to avoid those awkward Zoom moments. Um, thank you. Thank you for the welcome and the, and the introductions. And um, I was reflecting on this and just thinking, you know, how how funny it is to do these things on Zoom and to be in these virtual spaces when we're talking about attuning ourselves to our places and our bioregions and the world around us. And it's this interesting tension point that I found myself in a lot as Weaving Earth has more and more taken some of our teaching online, um, which is the strangeness of two dimensionality and the awkwardness of not being here and feeling one another in that way and being on a screen. Uh, so much of our work around attention is around going off of screens, but also the gift of the technology that so many people from so many places can come together with something like Ecoversity's Reimagining Education Conference. So it's really, I'm with the gift of it right now. And I just wanted to name also the awkwardness of Zoom because guaranteed something awkward will happen. And so, uh, I bring myself in with my awkwardness. My name is Will. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I am one of the co-founders of Weaving Earth and still work every day with Weaving Earth. Um, and one of the beings, uh, a more than human being who has really anchored my uh, awareness and my attunement is a beloved, sometimes feared, beloved creature um, who lives in the parts of California where I spend a lot of time, the rattlesnake. And there are many species of rattlesnake, and luckily they all have a rattle, um, which is a beautiful, um, a beautiful attribute of this creature because they are, they can be dangerous, they do have a venomous bite, but they have this rattle, which, um, has anybody here ever heard the rattle of a rattlesnake? I don't know if you have the same experience, but for me, it the first time I heard it, it was my body knew exactly what it was, even though I'd never heard it before in my life. And that taught me something about my body and what the millions of years of evolution on this planet had created in my system that I didn't even know was there. And so that being has been a reminder of that for me and also has just shown up for me at all of these times. Um, that have been really important moments of transition in my life. Uh, often not rattling, often just uh, a moment of seeing them before they rattle. So I'm grateful for the, the immediacy and the long, um, the long view teacher that the rattlesnake has been for me. And I will enter with that being by my side today and send it over to Bronte. Thank you, Will. Um, I'll never forget when I opened Will Scott's fridge where there was a rattlesnake inside. That's for another story. Um, <laughs> I'm Bronte. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm in Kashaya, Pomo territory in Northern California. 
Um, I have been a student of Weaving Earth and I am still a student of Weaving Earth and I'm so blessed to also be an educator and support curation for the adult programs. And I am feeling called to uplift the sheep that I am a companion to and um, who are my companions, who I care for here, co-care for with um, the stewards of where I live. And something that they're teaching me is just movement with them when I am moving with them the ways that my presence can create impact and create a ripple and relax or stress out their nervous systems. Um, they really teach me about my ripple and also ways when I when I do want to protect their safety and want to bring them to good food and want to bring them to where they need to go, um, that I support them in their movement that where I want them to go is also a place where they can relieve pressure. And it's one of the, um, it's one of the humane livestock handling techniques that is indigenous and also that Temple Grandin. Am I, what's Tim, mm -hmm. does anyone know Temple's last name? Um, yeah, the Temple Grandin um, uplifted as ways to support uh, depressurizing the experience for animals whose nervous system are so heightened. And they also teach me to care for my nervous system and how I want people to interact with me. So they really support my attunement. I'll pass it back to you, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you, Will and Bronte. Um, hi everyone. Again, my name is Lauren. I use she, her pronouns and I'm calling in from Southern Puma territory, Northern California. And I, um, one of, one of my guys, one of my allies is the turkey vulture. Um, Cathartes Aura. I love that name. Um, they have been a very just loving, consistent companion for me in um, in my deepening of intimacy with place. And I just am in awe. Like the, so often they're kind of like, they'll be flying in the sky and people are like, oh, what is it? What is it? Oh, it's just a turkey vulture, you know? But I'm like, it's not just a turkey vulture. Like they are, they are just the the bridge um in so many ways between life and death and their composting um what needs to be composted and i also have witnessed them eat grass seeds which um you know is is often not uplifted so um and i've just witnessed them um bowing to their elders and so many good teachings that i've learned from the turkey vulture so I just want to say thank you to the turkey vultures, their teachings of energy conservation and just how they subtly move and um, follow the thermals. So thank you to them. And the birds in general, um, similar to what Bronte was saying, have just been a very potent teacher of mine in witnessing my own ripple and how, how it is that I impact and am impacted by what's happening in the ecology as a part of the ecology. So thank you to all the winged ones. And um, with that, I'm thank you for some of you who have already done it, but I wanted to, to give you all, you know, 30 seconds to a minute to also think about how you would answer that question. And if you'd be willing to put it in the chat with your name and however else you might want to introduce yourself and to just um, share who it is, and I'm sure there's more than one, but um, who it is that is a more than human anchor or guide for you in your attunement journey. You can see we've got some hummingbird and some plants and the ocean and the fox. And Raymond and Rob's background together. 
<laughs> the earthworm. Yes, I love it. Brilliant. I just went in um, and worked with a group of first and second graders and I shared a story about a fox. And when I got done, it was like everyone, I was like, have you ever seen a fox? And everyone's like, I want to tell you my fox story. I want to tell you my fox story. And so I love hearing who your, um, your guides and allies are. And it just elicits that feeling like, Ooh, what story? And I have one too. So um, thank you for that feeling. and the magic and electricity that gets uplifted as we um, bear witness to and also bring attention to our um, beyond human, our more than human neighbors and allies. And I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna pass it to, Bronte, you're gonna go first this time since I passed it to Will before. If you wanna take us, see where you wanna take us in the conversation. And thank you everybody for answering in the chat. Thank you for that, Lauren. <clears throat> Uh-oh, I see some of my Atlanta, Georgia people up in here. What's up? That's my hometown. Um, and I love it. The Georgia people are with Lichen. Love it. Um, <laughs> loving a new book from um, A. Lori Palmer called Lichen Museum. And I'm really, today, for example, I was in the place that I go to play and where my altar is, and um, I saw some birds that are known as California towhees and some dark-eyed juncos. They were in these cut redwood limbs um, and chirping around and hopping around and gathering food. And I was writing in my journal and just my prayer for the day. And then I heard them all begin to alarm, which caused me to look up. And I saw a bird that is called the Cooper's Hawk swoop in and land and they all got away. Sadly, no one was taken. I was hoping for something a bit exciting this morning, um, but they didn't get any food and they just sort of landed. They landed there, but I was so grateful that I was attuned to the sound of the birds alarming and knew to look up and knew to look again. Um, and yeah, that I got to see that Cooper's hawks swoop in and wonder what would have happened if I didn't know to listen to that sort of sound and what other sort of miracles or things might I overlook in the land when I'm not able to attune to what the auditory or like just the sensorium or ecosystem is is trying to reveal to me. Um, there's been so many miracles in the land that I've been able to witness because of that level of pattern recognition and attention. And I'm so grateful for those. And I think it's really changed how I understand the nature of miracles to not be just these sort of random events, um, but actual encounters of my willingness to stay with the rigor of presence and to, to offer my presence again and again, and to let the land reveal their magic to me. So I'm curious, Lauren and Will, I know y'all have been students of that quality of presence for so many years, for decades. And I'm curious if you would share a little miracle story of a miracle that was only possible because the musculature of your awareness was super strong. I'll give you a second, whoever just feels that milagro come up first, you just start us off. You're All right. Well, okay. Take take us away. Lauren, you may not know this, but you are literally next to me on the screen. So you actually just pointed to me. That was well done. Um, clear. Yeah, thank you for this question and, and the the way you framed it, Bronte. Um, many images of moments came to my mind, and one that struck me uh happened many years ago uh in a beautiful part of 
the desert mountains of California, uh, Paiute Shoshone territory. And so for many years um, through our work at Weaving Earth, lots of time attuning and paying attention to the natural world and really giving myself to that practice of uh, Bronte named pattern awareness and um, feeling the sort of what's happening inside my body, what am I perceiving outside of my body, where are those two things talking to each other and the birds um, and other animals who are communicating with each other all the time on the landscape are our teachers in many ways, our accomplices, our allies in this work of remembering how to listen with a place uh, and be listened to by a place. And I was in these mountains um, alone, camping alone for a number of days. And before I went up there, I had a dream where a young coyote, in the dream, a young coyote came walking right up to me, looking at me, like directly, eye to eye. And that was the dream. It's just the image of the young coyote. And I had been trying to be quiet in this place because I wanted to listen to the place and I wanted to understand the patterns of this place. And one of the things I noticed is that every time I left my camp to do anything, the chipmunks, these little tiny, very, very cute golden mantled chipmunks would make this very high pitched alarm whenever I moved. It, I'm not going to try to mimic it because I don't think Zoom will be good, but just imagine a piercing high pitched sound. And then it would, and they would. Just hear it a little bit. If you could like, just try a little bit. Thank you, Bronte. That's payback right there for all the times I've made Bronte do this. Okay. It's, yeah, it'd be like, you get that? No, it didn't pick up. Yeah. High pitched. And they would pass it. And that like uh, suddenly I would like get up to go pee and then everyone in this valley would know that I had moved and any other wildlife around also must have known because they, they're paying attention like that. They listen across species with each other. Um, <laughs> I did make a noise. Uh, on the third day I was there, I was sitting quietly. I had not been moving all morning long. I had not been moving. I had been still. And I heard that sound that I had been causing the whole time. And I, this time I was like, that was not me. Like, I didn't, I didn't make that noise happen. And so I slowly got up and went towards where I saw I could see the chipmunk that had made the sound. And it was up on this rock ledge across the valley from me. So I went slowly and quietly as I could up towards that rock ledge to try to see what that chipmunk was seeing. And... It's a longer story. There's more details and pieces to it, but I will just end by saying that when I got to the top of that rock, rock ledge and looked over the other side, one of the things that happened was eventually a young coyote walked right up the other side of that rock ledge towards me, not far away from me at all. And the face of this coyote was the image from the dream I had had before I went out there. It was, it was the same face. It was the same moment. And that to me felt miraculous. It felt beyond something I could conjure, but it also felt like a result of paying attention, not just to the place over those three days, but having practiced the, I think I wrote it down, Bronte, because I loved how you said it, the willingness to stay with the rigor of presence, the practicing the musculature of awareness with the natural world over many, many years is what caused me to notice that those chipmunks were alarming on me in the first place. And then to allow me to go, whoa, they didn't alarm on me that time, but they did alarm. So let me go explore this. Let me follow that and see where it leads me. And it led me to a living dream encounter that that is like a story that has stayed with me um, and a moment that has stayed with me uh, ever since. So that is my answer. Thank you. Mm, I love that story, Will. Thank you. Um, just out of curiosity, does hearing that story, like for me, my I feel like my um, 
hair started standing up and I just feel this like, you know, when it's raining and there's water on the window, when the windows and they just come together and there's this kind of like electricity moment. I feel like listening to your story does that with all of my stories it like they bubble up. And that's one of the things, yeah, Bronte saying I, I also got shivers. It's one of the things, one of the practices that we're with a lot um, is just the power of sharing a story, witnessing a story and, and how it does attract like miracles attract miracles, like water attracts water. And so, um, you know, they come, they come together even more and they're, they're, uh, they're happening, but they're also, um, I feel like when they know that they're being received and witnessed, they more want to come. So, so many stories are flashing in my mind right now, but um, interestingly, the one I want to tell is um, I, let's see, my um, sister had about five, five years ago, a little over five years ago, had a beautiful um, daughter who I love dearly, my niece. And um, for some reason, when I would help put, her to bed I started telling her this story about a fox and I was I just was making this story up like it you know it just was kind of coming through as I was in the room and I was pulling on a lot of like the story had in it a lot of things that um, one would encounter on on a wander through the woods and there was like a part that there was like a part through the woods and then got to this river and then got to into the mountains and then got into the like the foothills and then got into the snow so you know it had a lot of um, ecological imagery and true story to it um, and also was you know a story about like where did the fox go and um that's funny. There wasn't there a song about that. That's not why I made up this story. But anyway, that was kind of the premise. Where did this fox go? And I just started telling her this story. And then foxes became like our thing, you know, like our, our point of connection. And she always wanted to hear the fox story and it would help her go to bed. And, you know, it was multiple years of me telling her this story. And so then um, we live across the country from each other. And so I also will in the mail, I'll send her these seasonal um, like treasure hunts. And there'll be things like, you know, in the autumn, it might be like find a leaf with red on it or um, find, you know, at some point, find a butterfly that has orange or see if you can get really close to a rabbit without scaring the rabbit away, like these things. And um and then I, oh, you know, I send her stickers to put on there for when she finds them. And I usually put something on there about a fox, but it's just kind of, you know, a little thing. And just this year, I decided I was making one and I wrote, I happened to be staying with her at the time that I was making her this one. So it wasn't being mailed. And I wrote on there, see if you can find a baby fox. And I thought, wow, that's, that's a hard one. Like, that's like you know, that's not like find a leaf with red. This, who, who, I don't know what, this could be a long journey. Like it might take a few years. And I was feeling also good about that because there is something about, you know, following the path um, of having your attention with something for so long. And then, you know, finally they show themselves. So I write this down and I put it on this nice paper and I, I'm ready to give it to her the next day. When she wakes up, I would like leave her these notes before she would, while she would wake up at the breakfast table. And when we woke up the next morning, I hadn't even given it to her yet. And there's all this commotion in the backyard and they're like, oh my gosh. And they're looking out there. And part of what, what brought the attention was that these birds were doing they were doing this kind of funny thing. They were making this noise and they were flying around and they just looked like disturbed, like something was there. And we looked out the window and that night a, a fox family had moved in to her backyard and it had four babies with it. Um, it was a mom and four babies and had moved in right into the backyard right after I wrote, find a fox baby. And she was like, 
beside herself. Like, I can't believe a fox came to my house, you know? Um, but also I couldn't believe that I just wrote that and there they were. Um, and so we got tons of time. Like we got, we set up a little camera and we got to really watch them. And I have a great video of them responding and reacting to the birds and, um, for many days, we got to watch these fox babies, you know, being fed and in and out of their den and all of this. And, you know, it would have been cool anyway, but it was, it felt so miraculous, um, in part because the fox story that I'd been telling for years before that was such a through line of connection and the foxes, like they meant something like we were in love with foxes, you know, and they were with us. And there was just something so beautiful about that. And, you know, we were in just like the suburbs in New Jersey and paying attention to miracles and they those foxes showed up. So that's the story that I want to tell. And I, I also love some of Sarah, you wrote, um, quoted Bronte, the, the musculature of your awareness. And I just, I love that too, because it is a muscle in, you know, in a way, like that's how we hold it. Like there is, like you do want, you got to like work it out um, and, um, and bring it with you for repetition and practice. And then the musculature of awareness um, brings ourselves to miraculous attention. And, um, you know, we hold it at we that this miraculous attention will help us um, be better ecological designers, ecological members, um, and show up as best we can to all these moments of, of uh, climate disaster and change that we're in. So I'm really thankful for those foxes and just the simple practice of the treasure hunt. And that's my story. And Bronzy, you got another question? Go ahead. All right, Go cool. Ahead. Do it. I do. And it, it's pulling from the last thing that you just shared, Lauren. Um, and maybe we could just give a little sparkle to these beautiful, magical, miracle stories. Um, yeah, I just want to honor that these miracles that you all have shared are, are not naive. And I'm not sure which one of y'all's elders says the point around the health, just bring in the quote, Lauren, about the health of a community in synchronicity. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of our elders uh, and teachers and dear friends who's an ancestor now, um, Gilbert Walking Bull, um, he would say that, that he, he would tell the health of community by how synchronicity stories were flowing. Like if synchronicities were happening, it meant that the community was well. And if they weren't, it would be a moment to be like, okay, what's what's wrong? Like, what do we need to tend to? What's needed? Um, and he he was a, um, a Lakota elder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking about that emphasis on health and synchronicity and the real power it is to be present to miracles and thinking of the spectacular nature of violence globally that we're witnessing and these spectacular in, in a disgusting way, grotesque um, forms of violence that, that are kind of most of the pattern. And um, yeah, the disturbance that is to our psyches, to our ability to recognize um, and be familiar with and attuned to the miraculous and the land. And so much that prevents people from these experiencing these sort of patterns via displacement, um, either through militarization or through, as climate refugees, people are being moved around in ways where you can't stay enough in a place to receive the gift of these sorts of patterns. Um, and I just would love to hear you all speak to why 
the protection of this access to miracles is so important um, and why you're doing this work as a form of liberatory practice and as a way that we might move through as a methodology toward liberation how is how is this this point of of the pattern recognition of the miracles how is it not naive how is it so like actually something desperately needed right now Yeah, big question. I, I I I hearted it on the screen. I wasn't expecting them to be floating heart balloons, but that is what happened. That must be a new thing. Um, yeah, that's a big question. I hope you'll speak to that too. Um, I know you did in a way in your in the framing of your question, but I would love to hear you speak to that too. Um, It reminds me there's a lot of entry points and I think it's a bigger question than I probably would be able to answer in, in the time we have, like that's a living question. Um, but I can say a few things. Um, one is that um, I was talking recently, I was writing and I'm working on this publication and I was writing about climate and I was writing about how um, kind of asking about the weather, like how's the weather right now has become this thing that's almost like made fun of, or it's like, oh, there's nothing else to talk about. So we'll like ask about the weather or it's like, um, you know, not important or it's like this really casual thing, but actually it's so essential. Like how's, how's the weather is an essential piece of information. And I think that, you know, um, in our long ancestral lines, you know, the many stories that are there, like knowing what's happening with the weather was essential. And I think that um, the branding of that, of it not being essential is part of the disconnection story. It's part of the separation story. And it's part of the um, like very well-designed systemic um, capturing of our attention to keep us like not paying attention to what is happening in the ecology and almost like um, intentionally um, designed to help us forget or like make us forget that we're a part of the ecology actually. Like, oh, how's the weather doing? Like, let me ask my skin, you know, let me ask the back of my neck. Let me ask um, my internal weather. Like there is a correlation between my internal weather and and the external weather, like the inner earth and the outer earth. So I'm just, I'm thinking about um, the many, um, like the displacement from, from climate displacement, from war, from human made um, terror, from all of these things. And how I, I think that though, um, I think that there is, um, well, at least one sort of prayer that I'm holding on to is that by um, by reclaiming our attention, by holding on to our attention of what's happening in on the earth, there is a way that our interconnectivity is like undeniable, actually. Like what's happening in the weather here is so related to what's happening in the weather all over. So there is a way that like the breadth of that um, makes our interconnection un undeniable. I have to hope that with, with enough attention there, it actually could change um, the way that we're oriented to so many systems of separation, systems of oppression, which are just, you know, feeding off of each other. And I think too that, um, you know, I, one of the questions that I wrote down was how do you tend to angst, fear, grief related to the intersecting environmental and social disasters? Because I've been feeling that a lot. I've had a lot of days of feeling hopeless of late, like just, God, is it like, I don't know. It's so big. Can Is there anything that I can do? 
And then when I'm working with, um, I happen to have spent a lot of time with youth in the past few weeks. So a lot of my stories right now are youth related, but when I'm working with the youth and watching them actually after care for looking for the earthworms and finding the earthworms and them being like, oh, in order to have these earthworms, I need to tend to the soil. Oh, in order to tend to the soil, I need to compost this thing from my lunch. Like, oh, wait, I don't want that to come in a plastic bag. Like, oh, wait, it is just so ridiculous that we ask for a plastic bag to hold our plastic bag of chips. Like, oh, like these kinds of connections um, that the youth are having, I, I have to hope that it's um, influencing and informing a next generation of people who are um, not seeing the lines of separation in the same way and are seeing the web as as connected through these miraculous stories or like feeling like there is something else um, helping. So I know though, you know, the somatic shape of looking up, also looking up to the birds does something to the somatic um, expression in our bodies. Like that is actually like an orientative settling practice that is really helpful. So, you know, the wind is calling us to that, the look up, look around, the birds are calling us to that, the look up, look around. And so I think that as we um, pay attention, as we hold that as miraculous, it is, it is actually miraculous. Yeah, the stretch that's coming right now, but it is miraculous to remember that my nervous system is very linked to that to the ecological nervous system and that's a that's an electrical powerful power filled responsibility so that's how i would answer that today dot 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 with so much more that i did not touch on i know like i'm i know that's not a complete answer but I'll leave it there because I've already done a lot of talking. And Bronte, maybe pass it back to you if you want to respond or or Will if you want to. I'm curious what you would share, Will. I, I can also share some things. Yeah, I'm happy to say a couple things. Thank you for that response and also for the question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm taken back. That question brings me back to the root of these practices and to the original intention behind them, you know, why we take ourselves out and, and work the musculature of our awareness as it relates to the world around us. Um, that can be done anywhere. That can be done in a schoolyard. It can be done waiting for the bus. It can be done in the garden. It can be done on the front porch. Um, it is different when we do it in different places, but the actual act of giving ourselves to a practice of remembering to pay attention and offering our awareness through our body to the world around us is something we can do anywhere. And something I've noticed is that I can move from place to place and the, the result of that practice is intact, even if I don't know the beings who live in that place. You know, maybe I don't know the, the birds as well when I go somewhere that, that's not my, my usual spot, but um, I can still sense in my body when they're alarmed or when they're at peace. Um, and that is also true when I'm in a room full of people. I can sense when we are agitated or when we're calm. And I say that because these practices at their core are about relationship. They're about connection. They're about remembering ourselves as part of this living, breathing, intelligent earth not separate from it. And at the root of so much of the tragedy and the violence and the displacement and the ecological crises and the collapse that we face today, I believe deep down one of the root causes of that 
is a human made belief in separation, in disconnection, in individualism, in I'm over here, you're over there. This applies ecologically, this applies socially, it just applies. And how do we undo the conditioning that taught us that we are separate, that we are dominant, that we are different, that we are disconnected and remember ourselves as, as interwoven as the earthworm and as interrelated and interdependent as everything else on this planet. So this commitment to practicing these practices for me is um, something that I would take with me anywhere I went. And e even though it can seem fun and seem nice and like we have games that are about expanding your awareness and ways that we like get people to do this that seem really playful and silly, but, they, but that's actually a way to make it work because it gets below the brain and into the body. And a huge part of these practices of awareness and connection are about exactly that. We, we learn from the body up rather than the brain down. It's very sort of Western education to go from the brain down. It keeps us in that separation story. To learn from the body up um, brings us back into a somatic experience of being alive, which to me is the experience of being part of nature. So I see these sometimes playful stories and practices actually as um, like deeply liberatory and deeply important if we are to remember how to work together, if we are remember to remember that all of our freedom is connected to all of our freedom then we have to be operating from a place of um, knowing that we are kin with one another and with this planet. And that doesn't, that is not an intellectual idea. It is an intellectual idea, but to operate from that place has to move into the heart, into the body. And um, yeah, it's my belief that, that we also need to be with, like sort of reunite ourselves with the intelligence of the natural world um, in order to meet the disease that separation and isolation has caused. So we can't, we can't heal isolation with more isolation. We can't heal conditioned thinking with the same mind that brought that thinking. So this is a way to put, turn the mind off and open up other capacities that we have for relationality. Uh, I want to stop there because I see we're, time is moving quick and I would love to hear your wisdom on this as well. Oh, thank you all so much. Yeah, I think just I'm thinking of some um, concrete examples in Black freedom traditions of collaborating with the Earth for Liberation. I'm thinking of Finally, in real life, getting to hear the barred owl um, last week while I was in the moon dance ceremony. And during a tune um, this year, our program, our adult program, we um, I taught a session with Taylor, who's sadly not here with us today, on um, Harriet Tubman's liberation craft and the level of um, ecological awareness required to support not only her own freedom, but the co-liberation of other Black enslaved folks. And one of those practices was um, at night, she was known to imitate the barred owl to let folks know it was safe to move. And so we practice over and over again. Who cooks for you? cooks for you and for the first time last week in ceremony I heard the like I was like here you what's going on but it was the owl um and it was just so yeah there's something about that sort of orientation there's something about the the lineage of um astral awareness for navigation um of being able to be to move with stealth and to not be tracked to move with water to not um to to 
push off a trace of your scent to know to hide in a sycamore gum tree and like find, you know, quiet places to protect yourself in these sites of refuge. And I think there's there's these very literal examples of like fugitivity and liberation that having an awareness with the land to know that they can protect you and that you can take refuge there is really powerful. Um, and then there's also this sort of like, and other people come to mind, Nat Turner and others who knew that there was divine appointments and were waiting for divine signs from the land to know when to enact moments of rebellion or resistance that I think are really profound. And I think we can learn from in our liberation movements um, of when is the right moment to act? When are the stars actually aligned um, with our prayer? When is the, uh, when is the weather aligned with our prayer? Um, and what, what more than human accomplices will really aid us in, in what we're trying to bring forth. And then there's this like Buddhist tradition of just presence that we've also been talking about and the ministry of presence that I think is something that, uh, liberates us from the fear that you were speaking to Lauren of like what is how are we moving through fear and and climate anxiety and climate grief um how do we how do we stay with this this violence that we're witnessing and the unpredictability of our of our lives and the vulnerability of our lives and I've just been finding gratitude and presence to be so reliable there and also liberatory, the discipline of willingness to just stay present because I really don't know what's about to go down. Um, there's really nothing I can do in presence. It just brings me into the failure <laughs> and acceptance <laughs> and humility uh, that of just the of just our complete and utter vulnerability. Um, we had at our session two of a tune um, this year, Taylor, uh, we had altars to different phenomena, altars to um, grief and altar to contradiction, um, these different altars that were like holding the prayer of our program. And um, Taylor introduced one that was an altar to collective annihilation, um, because it just seems like there is an utter desire to just wipe ourselves off of the planet not all of us but there's there's humans on this planet that are infected with this spirit of separation that are that want to see us all leave and don't care about the miracles we're talking about um but there's something about presence that i'm just like yeah, there, there's something there there's just really something there that i think both liberates ourselves and also offers other ways to be that um, challenge systems of domination and capitalism, because nothing about cap capitalism is present. It's it's a it's a concept based on things that don't exist on the future. Nothing about it is with like what are the resources that resources that are here among us to be used um, skillfully and with integrity right now. Um, and yeah, I just. I find that both in presence, I'm able to just calm down my worry. And I'm also able to be available for, to be interrupted by something beautiful, like the hospitality of the miracles we're talking about and uh, more interesting and life-affirming ways to show up to the earth around me and the people around me and myself. So that's what I would share. I'll pass it back to the center. And we're at time. Yes, Sal, thank you for that, Bronte. Um, Sal will let me know that we have 10 minutes, actually. So we are at the top of the hour, but that there's, there's 10 minutes um, that we could have. Um, if we want for some closing and and I don't know if we want if anyone wants to put anything in the chat um, back to us, but um, 
you know, 10 minutes goes quick also. So we probably should move our, our way to closing. <laughs> um, and I don't know, some of you maybe were, we're planning to leave at the top of the hour, which is right now. So um, if that's true, I think I wanna, um, I really wanted to close with a um, another invocation, like a closing invocation that actually, um, it speaks a lot to what was just being talked about. Um, and so I'm thinking to do that and then we can stay for another few minutes and just see what else is here that, and how we wanna close beyond that. But um, to honor time, I'm thinking to go with that. How's that sound, Bronte Will, Salo? Okay. Um, it's a love note to our attunement with wild fluency. And um, it kind of speaks to what wild fluency is. Um, but it's basically like remembering ourselves as um, fluent in the languages of the wild again, and what that actually asks of us, how that actually interrupts these, these systems that are by design capitalizing on our attention. So here's our love note. A love note to our attunement to wild fluency, as in a conversation that upholds our interrelated contract with, within the ecology we are a part of. A language that we are influencing and being influenced by, as in attuning to bird gesture and animal track, to winds ripple and the dance of fire and water to pollen on the wind and dew on the spider web, to pattern, to awe. An attunement to our wild fluency as in touching the earth's soma, an ancient language, an attention that invokes the liberated, the sensorial, oracular, and auspicious, an engagement with our multi-species somatic brilliance, an invocation of our naturing selves responsible members within the ecology we are a part of. May this practice lead us all to the stories and gestures in our relational lines where deep intimacy with the earth in daily life, in daily practice are thriving well into the future. And I, I, we hope that these stories, these conversations, the um, electricity of our shared waters inside our bodies have been um, drawn forth in a good way today. Um, I really hope for that, that thriving well into the future to be true. And Bronte, um, you wanna share how folks can study with us and take it from there? Yeah, thank you so much, Lauren, for that beautiful closing. Um, we have a gathering that we haven't posted yet, but if you follow us on Instagram um, at weaving underscore earth, or if you go to our website and sign up for our newsletter, you can learn about an upcoming, upcoming gathering online um, that will be long, a day long, more Zoom time on December 1st. Um, called Remystifying Inauguration. And we're going to be exploring the lineage of um, inauguration as a mystic practice with birds and the stars and reclaiming other sites of power outside of um, the forms of governance that are failing us. And then you can also subscribe to our newsletter or stay in touch for the next season of our adult program, Attune. It, I can say it was honestly one of the most badass things I've ever experienced or been a part of co-creating. Um, it just really touches me how this work that we've been talking about actually happens in the flesh. Um, and it was just a really rich container and so profound. Um, and I think I can speak, I think, for the entire group that we were all deeply transformed by the container. So we're going to be doing another round of a tune. So stay tuned to see what becomes of that.
Anything else, Lauren and Will? Any other things we got going on? I think those are the main upcoming ways to be involved. Um, yeah, and more things, more things in design and you know, in the hopper always, but in terms of uh, soon to come things, that, that's probably the right. The newsletter though, if you do uh, want to subscribe, we will announce all other new offerings as they emerge that way. It's That's pretty much what we use the newsletter for, so. Yeah, there's gonna be an online, we're gonna do bird kinship class again, online in 2025. And I don't know how many of you might be, um, just wanting to come visit, but we are having an in-person gathering on November 10th, a little cathartic dance party post-election and celebrating the work of Weaving Earth and, um, and you know, bringing our attention together on the dance floor. So yeah, it was, thank you for coming. I will maybe stay for just a couple more minutes, but thank you so much for coming to this session and bringing your attention to us and witnessing our miracle stories and, you know, it's always vulnerable to share in a heart filled way. So thank you for receiving our hearts. Um, thank you also to all the things that were not said and um, the many more things that need to be said on topics big as big as these. Um, but yeah, we're grateful. Thank you, Ecoversities. Oh,